well, thank you very much for coming. Um, this presentation, in this presentation, I'm going to cover the workflow I've been working on for um, developing the animation using motion capture, um, using Unreal Engine, and pretty much any bunch of tools that are available to any developer. The focus on this presentation is specifically going to be the fact that the motion capture is very expensive technology. We can just do it without microphone. Yeah, we can. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the focus on this first session is specifically going to be on the budget tools, uh, something that you can do by yourself at your home with the you know the limited amount or you know the resources you will spend on making sure that your animation and motion capture is going to be available. Um, I've been kind of like working on and off in this workflow for two and three years, so hopefully that's something that you can find useful for you know, your own projects. Maybe you can something incorporate to your own. Uh, um, a little bit about myself, so again, my name is Alex. Um, primarily, I'm a professional software engineer, but outside of the, you know, CGI or gaming industry at all, which is kind of like intentional because um, I'm pre pretty much focusing on any for the aspects as sort of like my creative threshold, um, and the software engineer is a completely separate field from me, just for the career. Um, I've been on and off working on uh, the 3D projects and the CGI in general for around, around a decade. Um, I was, I've been involved kind of like in a semi-professional project called Galaxy Software Mode, where I was a 3D developer. Um, and it was specifically um, a spiritual successor for the cancelled Star Wars Battlefront 3. Um, in the end, it kind of like didn't work out, but it's still, you know, those experience that I leveraged to work on myself, work on my own project as a solo developer. Um, and then in the end, I just decided to stick with it as a button. So there is the R station link you can um, scan with your phone, it's a regular QR code. Um, on the page over there, the latest work I'm going to also mention in this presentation is going to be my short cinematic that I developed in Unreal Engine 5. So if you're interested to check out the full one, feel free to um, go on the link. Alright, so briefly that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, what are the current tools that are currently available for developers, specifically as, a, as solid developers? Um, then I'm going to cover the, my Unreal Engine 5 animation mockup workflow. Uh, for every step that's going to be mentioned for this workflow, I'm going to give you know, certain tips and tricks to make sure that it's going to be you know, as smooth as possible for you. Um, then I'm briefly going to talk about the resources that can help you in your animation work uh, using this workflow. Um, and then after this, we're going to have a Q&A session. So motion capture is pretty much a holy grail of filming in the gaming industry. I'm pretty sure a lot of us are kind of like dreaming about when we were watching The Lord of the Rings and we were seeing Gollum and you know the, the performance that was given there using the CGI technology was just amazing. Or something that for example like with the Hellblade as in a sacrifice performance over here. Um, and many of us know that this is quite an expensive technology. We used to have you know, a lot of available space expensive costumes, fancy cameras in the case, so that's going to be pretty much the example for us. Uh, I think that was presented, yeah, that was presented on the um, Epic's um, GDC talk, um, so we're going to just briefly we'll take a look at this. And it was done in 2016, which is important distinction. Their gods consume to our life. They will use this power to destroy you. Who said that? <laughs> so if you look on that side of the stage, you'll see that 
Melina are actors have just performed the entire scene live in real time from within the hull by the world. So seeing this, uh, probably no one would think this is something you can pull off on yourself because uh, you know, it's not so many things where you, I mentioned about like how expensive it is. Uh, the point is, right now we are getting into uh, the certain stage of the technology where uh, what the uh, studios can allow themselves, what kind of technology they can allow themselves to use for the projects, and what the solo developer can reach out to. This gap is actually shrinking. Um, and of course, at the moment, obviously the best tools are going to be available for the studios with their you know, expensive budget they can spend in there. Um, but uh, for the solid developer, we can already make a step that is going to be more available for you know, any developer in the world. Um, and that's going to give the opportunity, for example, to express yourself. Maybe you wanted to try yourself out in the acting specifically, you know, in your game, in your project. Um, in the cinematic that you would love to make. Um, and the Hellblade is a good example because the actress, Melina Jurgens, actually had no prior acting experience before working on this project, so maybe you're going to be next. Um, so, uh, this is going to be the opportunity for us here to grow. Um, and there is already a wide market available for the indie studios, and over here I just mentioned the examples of the most, you know, probably most famous uh, projects and services you can find um, over you know, the internet, and you can use their technologies to do a motion capture, and they, at this point, are working really well. Um, however, they still quite expensive, I think around an average like $3,000 for just a costume um, and you still need to have like a, like a good helmet mount and like a really fancy camera that can capture your facial movements. So it's still not that available for a single developer. Um, so there must be something else. Um, and this is where uh, the VR tracking actually steps in. Um, what do we have in the, in the virtual reality tracking in general? So we have the headset, we have we have controllers, and in addition to them, you can add uh, different sets of the uh, VR tracking devices, which is going to be the flight tracker or the tinder tracker. Um, and it's getting this kind of technology is getting more popular and more affordable thanks to these projects like VR Chat. It's very popular right now just to step into the full body motion. Uh, tracking costume just you know for playing the game but what if we can use it to actually um, inject into our workflow what if we can actually uh, make it part of our you know project and um, just to make it more you know accessible for the for the for the developer with the less headache with less technical hassle um, that's the hardware we can use that's something we can stick with um, the examples I have given, um, so for example, the, the price is at a thousand bar. Um, the Life of 2.0 tracker is probably the most common one. I think right now it's on the second hand market. Why it doesn't officially sell them anymore? They specifically switch to buy 3.0 trackers, which are kind of pricey. And it's also this is the price for the single tracker. Um, there is also Tune Tracker, which was originally the Kickstarter project, and they successfully got it through. And I think they actually still uh, looking for the production, production, production of uh, different trackers uh, for the Tune Tracker. I think they don't sell them as uh, the single trackers separately. They usually sell them like in a set of the three or four or five trackers. Uh, and as I mentioned here, the minimum set of the three trackers is required for you, which is going to be, you know, your feet and your hip. Uh, six trackers is going to be recommended in this case, so you can add one for your chest and one for your hip, two for your elbows. So this is the part that you can use. What about the software? This is good. That's where it actually gets a little trickier because um, right now there is no various um, applications and the projects available on the internet. Like you can 
you really just search for VR mock-up app and you will get the results on the kind of like the underground-ish projects that are not really that widespread available or known for many developers. Um, and most of them, uh, for me personally, do not work very well. Um, in general, they were a good presenters of the idea with the fact that yes, the VR mock-up is actually can be you know, part of the production. Um, but in a different sense, for example, some of the apps did not have extensive feature, like the smoothing algorithm wasn't working very well because the VR mockup on its own is kind of like a shaky. It's not as, as, as precise as, for example, like a Rococo suit or the white um, But it's still something that can be used, and the point wasn't finding the right software in this case. And this is where I actually found one, and it's called VR mockup fusion. I'm just going to turn on a demo over here. Um, this is the project of the single developer that had a passion for the VR. Um, it's available completely free for Steam. You can use uh, various sets of the features. For example, over here, it's showing like different uh, solvers for the IK grid, which essentially means you can grab your weapon. Um, it is going to be, it's going to actually give you a smoothly export it. So for example, I'm just going to switch back over here. You can export your um, scene with the animation into Blender. Um, from there, you can actually work on it. Maybe, you know, you need to do some cleanup, but this is actually a raw result you can achieve over there, which on its own is, honestly, back in the day, it was actually quite impressive. Um, Right now, I think, as I said before, it's available for free in Steam. Uh, there is some extensive feature that only under the paywall, which is actually a pretty small paywall. So if you're interested, you can support the developer on the Patreon. Uh, it's going to give you a list of the different features you can use for your own work. But honestly, on its own, just using the free version should be, should be just good enough uh, to fulfill your needs. But there is also the downsides for the VR mockup. As I mentioned before, the VR tracking is uh, far from perfect. It's not as precise as uh, one of those, you know, expensive costumes, which obviously they, that's why it would be that expensive. Um, you will definitely encounter quite a bunch of issues with the wobbling and jumping of your, you know, limbs or bones. It's specifically going to be an issue if you have the problem with the hip tracker, for example. When it's going to be jumping back and forth, the cleanup of the animation is going to be quite heavy in this case. Um, it might be also hard to do some complex movements, like I don't know, maybe like dancing, some action fighting, or maybe like parkour, for example. Like, probably going to be hard to do it with the headset on your head, and especially if it's wired on, it's going to be really interesting to see. Um, and the most important distinction, um, it's going to require you to do a lot of things. So, for example, I have the, you know, the test um, recording over here I've made, um, and you can see, like, in this one, it's kind of, like, pretty tricky, the twist of the bones, and especially the hip bone is kind of, like, weird here, um, and it's kind of, like, jumping back and forth, the elbow is going to be going inside. Um, elbow sometimes is, is probably the most prominent, um, where the prominent issues you will find. It. So, you can see it's far from perfect, it's definitely. But the point is, this is something that we can actually uh, work with. So we can get to a point where on the left you will see that this is the recorded animation I've done, completely raw. On the right, it's, it's a cleaned up animation, as you can see, it seems to be more proper, it's more smooth, there is less jumping, um, and in general this is something you can actually use in a production. So, how do we get there? This is the mockup workflow that I've been uh, working on so far. So you have the mockup fusion VR over here. Um, you can use either Lightning or FBX Expert to send uh, the animation data to Unreal Engine. Um, Lightning is the most preferable option. It's going to give you the less headache. Obviously, if your hardware supports supposed to this case, because you will need to run two applications uh, running on VR. Um, so you need to make sure that if that's something you can pull off, it's going to be really, really smooth. Um, but FBX export is uh, still an option. 
um, so you can obviously use that. In the Unreal Engine, when the animation is going to get there, we are going to bake the animation into the control rig. We're going to use various uh, tools available in the Unreal to clean up the animation. I'm going to talk about uh, those tools a bit later. Um, to go a little further, for this is actually going to be your first iteration for the cleanup, uh, but it's not going to be there yet. So in order to do more extensive uh, cleanup for the animation, we're actually going to send it to Blender. Um, either, again, uh, there's an option to use send to Unreal plugin. Um, I cannot vouch for this because I actually haven't used it. And in this step, I actually found that the VS export is just going to be easier and especially easier to trace um, you know, the animation when you uh, have the raw animation and when you actually can clean it up so you can have separate files for the observations. Um, and then the Blender, um, as I mentioned over here, we're going to use these plugins. Uh, we, need to, we need to redefine um, the animation layer uh, and then animate it and then wrap it. Uh, so those are the plugins that you will need, you know, either to buy or access for free. Some of them are for free, like you need to redefine and I think animate it is for free. Animation layers in the Gravit are going to be available on the Blender Marketplace. Uh, they are not super expensive, but if you want to you know, make them part of your workflow, you need to be sure to get them because they are really, really powerful tools. And then uh, we're going to set our um, animation background to legend, where uh, we actually can have multiple iterations. So, for example, you make the first cleanup in Unreal Engine, you send it to Blender, uh, then you send it back and you notice there are some issues that are specifically, you know, can be fixed on the Blender. You can always make as many iterations as you want and it's not going to affect the quality of your animation. But in the end, when we're going to get to Unreal Engine, this is where you can actually render your animation in a sequencer if you know, you're making the cinematic short or if you want to make it part of your game, for example. Uh, but in, in this case, uh, it's kind of like the icon we need, so that's like we're going to render the movie in this case. And all this can be done in Android Legend. So moving on, how do we start uh, going from the mock-up vision in Android Legend 5? Lightning, as I mentioned before, is the simplest option. Uh, right now, it's actually accessible as a paid plugin. Um, it used to be free. Uh, it's not a necessary uh, purchase that you will need to make, but if you will want to make it as smooth as possible, and you can actually afford this, you're welcome to purchase the plugin. Um, the most important part in this case, you need to make sure that both your skeletons or armature is going to be the same in both applications. Um, and I would actually recommend to make sure that the armature or the skeleton is going to be the same across your whole workflow. Um, you can use uh, substitute skeletons like mannequin, for example, um, but you will need to decide beforehand how what exactly you're going to do with the animation. So in my case, um, I wanted to render it with a character, and my character was the metahuman, so I needed to make sure that um, at the very least, uh, the skeleton is going to be available in both Mockup Fusion and Unreal Engine 5, which is obviously pretty simple to put it there. Uh, for the Mockup Fusion, uh, it is actually, I think, available in the Steam uh, Workshop as the kind of like additional asset you can just uh, download. Um, and once you will um, add it to your account, you, will, you can launch the Mockup Fusion and it will give you the option to select it as an avatar. So over here, I will just run the example of the recording session that I've made. And I think, so yeah, everything over here is done through the light link. So as you can see, whatever the movements you're performing on the mock-up fusion, they are directly transferred to uh, currently running the simulation in Unreal Engine 5. Um, you can already see there are some problems with the elbows, which is like really prominent issue that I personally I've been um, encountering so far, but it's not something that can, you know, stop things going. This is something that you can actually pretty easily fix the control room. So over here, uh, what we're going to do, we're actually going to go to uh, uh, take recorder. Um, and in this case, this is how we're going to record our animation. We're going to grab our character, which in my case is actually going to be the blueprint uh, with the character in it. 
and then we're going to start the recording. So as you can see uh, in the sequencer that uh, we're having right now, it creates all of your recording data. Um, all of it is going to be available as just a regular animation file. You can, you can easily export it to you know, separate programs that shouldn't be blended if you were working with Maya, for example, or previous Max. Um, so we have recorded the animation. Um, and uh, we're just going to try to find it over here. And by default, the animation for the tape recorder is going to be in the cinematics takes, and it's all going to be in a folder sorted by the date. And over here, you can actually see that we have the scene, which has your static character um, added into the sequencer, and that's your animation. Um, and it's going to be animation for both your body and the facial capture. So, for example, if you're doing the live leak, um, if you will set up your blueprint of the character properly, you can actually record both at the same time. Okay. So, moving on, uh, control rig is going to be our primary tool uh, to use for uh, you know, the animation cleanup. Um, and hopefully everyone's familiar with the control rig. Um, it's a very powerful tool that's been added, I think, in 4.26, um, and it's been refined really well in Android Legend 5 so far. Um, it's really easy to um, bake your animation into the control rig. Uh, you can have multiple control rigs in a single scene. So, for example, this is something that I've noticed in a Blender. It could be really tricky and it can be really performance heavy in your scene. Um, in Unreal, it's not a problem at all. So, it's really easy to actually build your scene the way you actually want to. And this is where we actually want to start the cleanup process. Uh, the main tools we're going to use is going to be the additive layers. So, if you can See, just a little bit over here, we have two layers of the control rig, and one of them is the additive layer, which has additional keyframes. This is the way you can actually adjust your animation. So, for example, if your hand in the right position, you can move it all the way. Um, the way it's working, if you are familiar with the Maya, Maya has the built in tools for the animations layer, and that's exactly the same uh, capabilities you can. Um, do with the, the control rig in under motion file. Um, what I would also recommend when you're working on your scenes, uh, make sure to set up two versions of the same sequencer, so it's just two separate sequencer files. Um, set up one just for the control rig keyframes and one for the only animation, because that way uh, when you will be you're most likely going to have multiple iterations and adjustments for your animation in the control rig. Um, once you will finish the job, uh, later on you will notice you missed some things, like your hand is probably, you know, crossing the net, your mesh, like going ahead too much. Uh, you can always go back, you can readjust it, you can bake it into the animation file, and then in your final sequencer, all of these changes will be reflected, and you don't need to worry about if you're going to miss something in your, you know, final sequencer file. So, uh... Here's the example I did for the mockup cleanup. Let me just move a little bit. So over here, you will see what I'm trying to do is I have the uh, I have the blueprint of the character and it has the skeletal mesh, with the animation added to it. So I'm going to click uh, on the right click on the body and then I choose the basic control rig for the meta human. Usually the process is fairly fast, especially if your animation is not too long. Um, and there's definitely going to be a lot of things for you to work on. Um, in this example, I'm going to focus on adjusting the right hand. Um, once we will move forward, um, you will see that the overall um, how the character is tilted in general is not correct. And you will, see, you, will, you will see that the hand is actually going inside of the head. So this is how we can actually adjust it. Um, so right here, I have created the additional layer where I'm actually going to add different keyframes to uh, the hand uh, bone. Um, and the way I actually like to do this is I, I have the two sets of the keyframes. So one is going to be on the beginning of the end, which is going to indicate your original animation, something that's supposed to be untouchable. 
Um, and then within this range, you are going to create the start and end frames where you can actually adjust your position of your bow. That way, oops, sorry. Um, that way, when you are actually going to bake your animation, um, it's going to be the smooth transition between what was your original position and when that was your adjustment. So again, we start with in the very beginning. Uh, it's going to depend from your animation wherever you want to start and end it. So just make sure to be reasonable about what kind of um, the, the range of the animation you're trying to um, adjust in this case. So we're going to set up a keyframe over here and we're going to move the hand a little far away just to make sure it's going to be like talking on the common link in this case. And it's not going to be, you know, the only change that we're going to do in this case. Um, and then we're going to copy the same keyframe to make sure it's going to be in the same position as, you know, the previous keyframe. Um, so that way it looks a little bit better. But there are still problems with the elbow direction in this case, and this is where we actually have the pole bone, uh, which controls you know, the rotation of your elbow in this case, and that's something that we need to adjust in a similar way too. So we're going to set our uh, keyframes in uh, the same, pretty much the same range, um, and we're going to just adjust the position of the elbow bone a little bit away from the head in this case. So it looks a little bit better, and we do the same at the very end, we're going to copy paste the same keyframe, um, and you will notice that there is a jumping movement in the elbow, so that's something that also uh, should be adjusted. Um, there are multiple ways to do this, um, usually it shows you know, the imperfection of the motion capture in this case, and that's something that you will need to, that's something you're going to encounter a lot. Um, but right now, we're actually going to bake our layers into one. That way, it's just going to be easier to work with her. Um, and in order to adjust, uh, you know, this kind of like jumping back and forth for the elbow, we are going to use the animation graph. Um, so as you can see, those kind of like big clips, they usually indicate on the, on the graph that there's been a very sudden change, you know, in the, in the Coordinate, um, and it's usually, usually it's going to be noticeable in you know, both location and rotation. Um, scale usually is not a you know a concern unless you explicitly change the scale of your bone. Uh, but over here, you know, I'm trying to kind of like move it away, and I'm noticing there's like a snapping option available. So moving it a little full, uh, up just makes it a little easier. It's not perfect. It's still going to require the cleanup. That's not something that we need to worry about over here because um, Unreal tool sets uh, for now are not really that versatile for you know deep cleanup of the animation graph. Uh, this is something that we can do in the Blender uh, much much easier. But right now we're just making the first adjustments. Um, and seeing if it's just going to make it a little easier to move forward and uh, finish the major work and clean up in Blender. So I'm just going to stop here because it's pretty much going to be the same, same process as the end of the video. And we're going to move on. So um, now we're switching from Unreal Engine 5 to Blender. The best bet in this case is going to be using the UE to reify plugin. Um, what it's going to do for you is, uh, when you're going to import your skeleton of the character into Blender, you don't have those kind of like out-of-the-box tools available for converting it into the control rig, just like it is in Unreal Engine 5. So this plugin is actually gives you the ability um, to quickly convert both your character and the animation assigned to this character into control rig, which is going to be give you the same capabilities as in Unreal Engine 5. Um, by default, it has, I think, a uh, mannequin from both UE4 and UE5 available. Mannequin is not available right after that, but it's accessible, you can download it from the online. I think it's um, probably the very first link in Unreal Engine 4. Um, 
So what it's going to be did is um, we can use this template to convert, convert your um, regular skeleton character into the control character. And after this, that's where we're going to use the additional tools like animation layers, which is going to be pretty much the same as I mentioned in the Maya capabilities, or making the additional array of whether the control we can underwatch the So exactly the same capabilities. Um, then um, animate is an additional plugin for the animation graph. It's going to give you um, different functions for you know controlling and cleaning up your animation graph. Um, you don't have to use it. Um, the right on its own, the blender capabilities are actually pretty good, so you can you know just do it on its own pretty good. Um, and then it's kind of like the honorable mention, but I also mentioned the Gravit plugin, um, which is specifically going to give you the capabilities to interact with the object. So, for example, if you want to grab something, you can attach it to your hand, which is you know not part of your skeleton. Um, but I'm going to talk about the, um, the interaction a little bit. So this is where we're going to start uh, working with the uh, UE to Rigify plugin. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, Rigify is kind of like the terminology in the Blender itself, which essentially devotes like the heavy run system for creating the control rig for various sets of the you know, skeletons. So it's essentially pretty much the same as a control rig. Um, one big downside I'm actually going to mention right after that is um, so when you bake your animation or control rig in Unreal Engine 5, it actually creates uh, keyframes uh, for your controls for both FK and IK, um, and I assume everyone knows like what an FK and IK controls is. Um, if not, uh, to simply explain this, FK is the forward kinematics is when you uh, when your children bone is actually inheriting your parent bone rotation. So, for example, if you want to rotate the hand. You need to rotate the shoulder, then your elbow, then your hand. Um, for inverse kinematics, the process is kind of like vice versa. You can actually grab the control for your hand and just move it away. Uh, so that way it's actually much easier to, you know, uh, work with the animation um, in your, you know, free animation in general. So here is the test recording I also did for Blender. So over here you will see that the source is actually where we start with um, and over here I'm actually going to choose convert our animation um, and then and after this we usually just need to wait a little bit. Um, so over here uh, we actually already have some animation applied to the control rig. Um, this is something that also, I also imported uh, beforehand um, and for the blender it usually takes quite a bit to make sure that the animation is stayed properly in the control rig. So um, sorry. So you will need to make sure to wait just a little bit to make sure it's the controls. Okay, so we have our animation. You will see some of the controls are not moving. Um, and that is because those are... Oh, why is it moving back? I'm so sorry. You probably don't need to use the arrows to control the video. So over here you will see these controls like for the arm and for your feet, they are not moving. It's because uh, the plugin is baking the animation on just your regular controls and your IK controls are usually untouched when you just want to get started the port. So this is something that we're going to fix. Um, and also, uh, the control rig in the Blender is right off the bat is going to have like a tons of different controls. Like maybe some you can see there's like some adjustment bones which are like indicated with the you know the little spheres. Uh, we usually indicate like the twist control you can you know uh, adjust in your Blender. Um, and a Blender gives you the capability to hide those layers of the you know controls. Um, so you just you, you can just focus on the specific areas. Otherwise, it's just going to be really overwhelming to work on. So, as you can see, the regular FK controls are working. Um, and over here, you will see the influence. So, right now, it is set to 1, which means that all of the influence is actually going to the forward kinematic bone. Um, which is actually good. That means that the animation baked just fine. But it's not enough for our needs. 
uh, we need to actually make sure that our inverse kinematics bonds are also going to um, have the you know the keyframes. And that is actually what I'm going to do over here. Um, let me just go back a little bit. So over here, you'll see there's going to be this action, and it's going to ask you the question like, are you going to apply snap IK to FK, which means you're going to essentially bake your animation that is coming from your forward kinematic bone to your inverse kinematic bone. That way, you will see that your you know, IK control is in the right position. That means you can easily adjust you know, the position of your feet or with your hand. Um, and it's not going to affect the whole body. So as you can see, you can easily control your hands. Um, and you can easily adjust your position. Um, when you're going to change you know, the hip bone, which is usually on the top of the hierarchy, um, it is not going to affect your IP on this case. Alright, so, um, so you definitely notice there's going to be some issues um, in the animation that you add to your control rig, so how do we fix this? So this is where the animation layers plugin steps in. Um, and in this example, uh, you will see that uh, something went wrong when I was importing the character. Um, I have the separate wall responsible for the helmet. And on um, and it was actually you know looking fine, but when I put it into Blender, it got turned from 90 degrees angle. Um, so how do we fix this? Um, so we don't need, we actually don't need to make it to control the over here. Um, you can if you want to, but if you if there's some you know noticeable issues you want to fix right with that, you can obviously work with your original um, armature. So we're going to go to animation layers, um, and over here you will see there's going to be a top animation layer and there's going to be a base layer. It's going to work pretty much the same way as you have seen in the Unreal Engine 5, where you have two layers of the control rig. Um, the only difference is um, the additional layer, layer and that's actually in the bottom. Over here, it's on the top of the layer. And we are actually modifying the animation layer. So we're just you know, making a twist, and it's going to be exactly 90 degrees. And it's going to be the change only in this specific bone, uh, which is the important part because when in Unreal Engine you're baking your layers you know, with additional animation, if I, if I remember correctly, it actually bakes all the changes to all the bones that are you know, part of the skeleton. Um, the good thing about the animation plugin in the Blender is you can bake uh, the changes only to the specific bones, and it's actually going to be much faster because you don't need to you know, perform the changes for your you know, entire skeleton, your entire animation. It's going to be just a very small um, time range and just going to be a very small area of the adjustment. Um, so again, we're um, turning the bone in this case, and it's again, it's going to be the change in the animation layer. You see everything just looks fine. Um, and if all the spaces on and off, you will see that this is going to be pretty much the base layer. Um, and then we're going to select just the specific bone and we're going to merge it. And it's going to be just a second uh, for the changes. And now you have all the changes into your original animation. The same principle is going to be applied to any changes you're going to be performing with your animation. Um, you can just change the, you know, the position of your hip bone this way. Um, and all the additional changes I will definitely recommend uh, during the control. Uh, some of the small changes, again, you can do in your original skeleton. But to make more consistent changes, definitely make sure to do it in the control. So how do we, uh, why do we use animation graph for Blender in this case? Um, so both Unreal Engine 5 and Blender have really good tool set for the animation graph. Um, what I would say is for Unreal Engine sometimes it's kind of like difficult to work with because for example, um, let's say you're going to um, make a change uh, for the character, you're not going to select any specific button. What the animal is going to do for you is when you're going to open the animation graph, it's actually going to render all of the keyframes for all of the bones. And it's going to eat up your memory, and it's going to you know, slow down the performance of you know, your, your project in this case. 
And the sad thing is, even if you're going to close the animation graph, it's not going to free up the space uh, in the memory. So you actually need to restart um, or some your project to make sure it's actually going to be able you know, to So it's kind of like a really nasty but annoying thing uh, that you can encounter when working with the animation graph in the Unreal. Um, this is not something that uh, you can encounter in the Blender. It's very well optimized, so any kind of changes you can do or you need to do in your animation curve, um, I definitely highly recommend using the Blender. Um, and if that's not going to be enough, we can uh, use the Animate plugin, uh, which I think I'm just going to show a little bit in this video. Um, so the very prominent issues that you will encounter with the motion capture is going to be your feet. So there's going to be you know a lot of like shaking and wobbling, and obviously it depends from what kind of like the purpose of the animation is going to be. But in many cases, you want to make sure that you know your feet are uh, hard on the, on the ground, and got to make sure it's not going to be uh, really shaky. So this is where working with the animation graph is going to be useful in this case. Um, and right now we are just looking at the IK control for your foot. Um, and in general, it seems to be fairly fine until you actually usually step in and you will see there's a lot of like, you know, uh, jumping in between the keyframes. And uh, the easiest way, oh sorry, just, there we go. So the easiest way how you can actually fix it is you're going to use the smoothing algorithm that is uh, built into the blender. And it actually gives you the option to use a, like a legacy algorithm or the Gaussian algorithm. Um, either way is working. Uh, obviously, they recommend using the latest one, but the Gaussian algorithm definitely use that. Um, over here, I just applied it once, and there is not that many changes. It just makes it a little bit better. Uh, but usually, you will need to um, apply multiple iterations of the smoothing algorithm. So the easiest way in this case, you um, assign a hotkey for the smoothing algorithm and you just make it like, I don't know, I usually make like 10 15 times just to make it as smooth as possible. But even in this case, it's not going to be enough. Uh, sometimes you need to step in for the specific um, animation curves and readjust them. And this is where the animate uh, plugin steps in. It actually gives you different kind of filters that you can use. Um, I'm honestly not really well familiar with all of them. Um, but I usually use the push and pull which is, uh, in, as you can see over here, actually for the problem with the, the plugin version, so I need to, I need to um, read and load a new version. So the push and pull is just going to adjust the amplitude of your animation, and in my cases, it's usually the biggest problem that you encounter, so the push and pulling filtering is um, usually helping with most of the issues that you're going to encounter with your animation curve. And again, the same principles can be applied to um, any different bone uh, in the skeleton of your character. And it's really, really amazing and powerful tool you can incorporate into the cleanup of your animation. So, um, once we will bring the um, uh, character back into Unreal Engine, uh, we can do various things. So, for example, for my project, the biggest problem that I have encountered is uh, my first character was um, interacting with the second character because um, uh, she was rather repellent. How can we do this? Um, and the problem in this case is going to be that you are actually trying to make this first skeleton interact with the second skeleton. And there were no you know, uh, out of the box um, capabilities available either both in the Blender and the Real Engine when I started to work on this. But there are actually a few options you can use in this case. Um, and again, as an honorable mention, there is a graphic plugin that is available in the Blender. Um, it's going to give you the capabilities to interact with the different objects um, in your scene. You can also interact with a different um, you know, the skeleton as well in this case. Um, the reason why I'm not showing it here is because um, the final scene uh, I was making an Unreal Engine 5 um, and baking those kind of changes and then bringing them back into Unreal from Blender is sometimes could be a little tricky. Um, it is still Drupal if you want to do it this way, but um, Unreal Engine 5 actually just got the new feature I think 5.1 or 2. Correctly. Animation constraints. 
um, what exactly this actually means. So let's say you are trying to control a, set, a first object and you want to make sure that the changes are going to be reflected on the second object. So let's say you're going to have the location constraints so when you move the first object, you want to make sure the second object is going to be more fluid as well. Uh, same with the rotation, scaling as well. Um, the most important constraint that is going to be helpful in this case for you is going to be the parent constraint. So that means is, um, actually I'm not going to show it in the video here. So, you, he, you see here that um, that's actually what we want to get. We want to make sure that the, you know, the second character wants to grab the element of the first character. Um, the important distinction in this case is this is actually the separate static object. It is technically not part of your, you know, my animation character. It's not part of the skeleton itself. It is the object that is having the baked um, ample movements coming from you know, the head of the first character. Um, this is something that I found really easy to control, just doing those kind of you know, interactions you know, with the separate characters that are you know, not part of the skeleton. It is definitely doable if it's part of the skeleton, but in this case, you need to make sure that it's actually going to be a completely um, separate um, uh, a completely separate object that is part of the skeleton. So it should not be part of the same character in this case. Um, and if it, usually sometimes in this case it gets really complicated, so um, if it's a very small change that you will need to do, or you know, the very small thing you want to show in your scene, I would recommend just to look at static um, objects. It's just going to be much easier and uh, smoother. So over here, you will see that uh, we actually have our keyframes for the object uh, that are tied to the first character. And over here, there is, um, you know, I added the label where this interaction ends, and the helmet should actually follow the hand of the second character. So how do we do this? So we move the keyframe, you know, to our starting position, and you see right now it's not doing much. And we go to the constraints and we select the parent. And now we are going to uh, select the set, uh, left hand of the second character. And once we, you know, we move the position, you can see that we are going back. And once it's attached, you can see the hand is actually grabbing the helmet in this case. Um, and in order to actually make this change, because it's still the movements are coming as a part of the constraints and you know, in most of the cases, you want to make sure that your um, animation is actually baked into the keyframes. So we can set uh, the final influence over here. It's actually going to set uh, where you know the influence of the constraint ends, and then you make the right click on the constraint itself, and you, then you're going to select bake. So this is where it actually removes the influence of the constraint itself, but you can see. And especially, it's, it's not noticeable through the tracing over here that all of your, you know, movements are actually coming as the animation from the keyframes. Uh, there is no constraints involved. And this is something you can do for, you know, different things. You can do it with the web lens. So for example, you know, it's part of the holster, which is usually um, web is kind of like part of the bone slot. Uh, you know, holster. So in this case, you kind of like you need to you should perform like you know, complex changes, moving, uh, second, moving the object from you know the first bone to the second one. For uh, you know the regular scenes, you don't need to worry about this. You can just use the you know the static objects, um, and the animation constraint with the parent is going to help a lot to build the you know the interaction of your characters. So what about the facial mode head? Um, again, as I said, there is just only two words with a human animator. Um, it's been a huge headache, especially for me, trying to figure out uh, what are the tool sets that are available, what I can use to make uh, at least consistent animation. Um, and with the way it used to be, um, 
Epic Games actually released the Lifelink app. You can you know, do your um, motion capture uh, for this. Um, and this is actually what I've been doing so far, but um, I had to make a lot of free adjustments. Sometimes I needed to make the exaggeration for the animation to make sure it will be livable. It will translate the, you know, the emotion that I'm trying to show the scene. With a MetaHuman animator, um, the capabilities are much better for any person that you know, has the hands for the iPhone. Um, I think it supports iPhone 11 and higher. Um, the officially, I think the documentation says 11, iPhone 12 is recommended, but I tested it on iPhone 11, it was working fine. Um, so this is something that I would say is a must-have if you want to perform the facial uh, facial mockup. And again, this is also the example I'm going to show here for the, the Hellblade sequel. So the actress is going to perform live on stage um, using the MetaHuman and the iPhone. So does MetaHuman should now be ready in the Hellblade? Oh, sorry, I need performance capture to live like a mirror. I needed to capture whether I'm acting scared or angry. <sighs> and sometimes all I need is a look. That's it. You don't need to worry about, um, honestly, you don't need to worry about any other technology, um, you know, testing what works and what, what doesn't. Um, Obviously, right now, uh, MetaHuman animator is applicable only to MetaHumans. Um, I'm not aware if there are any, you know, kind of like a, a plugins or any ex extensive support to make sure this animation is available, you know, with a different skeleton. Um, so definitely, if you're using different skeleton, you probably need to, you know, make a little more research. What you can do in this case, um, MetaHuman is a really powerful tool. I honestly uh, found I didn't need anything else. I didn't need to look at any other skeleton. It performs a little just right there. Um, uh, virtual reality motion capture is not the only option. Um, there is also different uh, kinds of services that are getting more available. Um, the really good one that I've uh, tested out recently called Move AI. Um, it is the marketless mockup uh, service where you have, um, at the very least, three iPhone cameras from you know, the different positions in the room, and you also have the base um, base device which can be either iPhone or iPad. Um, you can also use the regular cameras. I think they call it experimental mode. Um, I didn't play much around this, but this option is definitely there if you want to test it out. Um, it gives you much cleaner and a faster result. Um, you don't need to worry that much about the cleanup as you will need to with the uh, VR mocap. Uh, but in this case, it's the paid service you need to pay like um, $30 per month. Um, but again, if that's something that you will find that is working for you, it's much better than the VR motion capture feel free to jump back. Um, there's just a very short, um, you know, the scene I have recorded, there is completely no cleanup over here. There's just completely raw human animator um, for the face, and then the movie eye movements for the body. This is about the whole just following all this. It is. It is about honor. Where is the honor in marching lively to our deaths? It is not our fault. We are part of something larger. We are not independent of one another. I'm sorry, I cannot just follow orders when I know they're wrong. Especially when lives are at stake. You will if you support the system we fight for. I do support I do. But I am not just another number. None of us are. Vice, where are you going? To round up some. So, um, if you have noticed, um, there is kind of like more uh, micro movements uh, when you use movie eye because with the VR mockup is actually it's more a little more stiff movements. You can see there's like less um, movements with the shoulders, with your chest, and over here you can see just kind of like makes the character more livable. You can see just how movements are just more more fluid. 
So I personally actually planning to switch um, my workflow uh, completely to the Move AI. Uh, but again, the VR mockup is still the option if that's something that you prefer to use for available tools. So, as I mentioned before, uh, this whole workflow was used for me to develop my own uh, small cinematic shorts. Um, and I wanted to recreate the scene from the Star Wars The Clone Wars TV show. Um, beforehand, I would say I had completely zero experience working with the cinematics. I had no you know, basic uh, knowledge of something that you would expect from it just for it from the regular artistic type, so which is like a camera setup, lighting, color grading, uh, composition, and how do you actually render the movie in the religion. Um, and I would say right with that, the most useful resource for me was the uh, William Fosher's YouTube channel. Um, if you're not familiar with this, uh, this is a very experienced developer that uh, making a lot of uh, useful uh, learning information about how you, um, you can create your cinematic, how you can set up your camera properly, um, how you can actually render the movie, and uh, what are kind of like the, you know, the best options uh, available for you for like, things like color grading or you know, lighting in general. Um, so I would definitely recommend, like, no matter what kind of experience you have with the cinematic, you know, uh, cinematics in general, I would say it's really, really amazing uh, resource for you to have and, you know, the cheat sheet you can always access. Um, in the end, I would say that uh, definitely the result from the short cinematic was far from perfect. Um, I was working on this for, as part of the workflow for around two years, and um, there is a lot of stiffness um, in the animation. I have uh, done so far, especially it's very noticeable in like facial animation, because I actually haven't been using the many human animator, so um, I'm not going to show it um, right over here, uh, but I will show just a cut of the, uh, the cinematic role later. So if you are interested, you can check out my short cinematic and my station page, and you will definitely notice these problems. Um, but I still, uh, I still take this as a very good um, step forward for myself to dive deeper into, you know, uh, doing the cinematics in some real engine and just gaining more experience. So in the end, what do we have, what do we have with the, uh, the cinematic experience with the you know, in Unreal Engine 5? Um, we used to have the times where um, we didn't have any tools available for us um, to do anything you know, consistent with the animation. So mostly it was just like regular keyframes animation you need to do by, you know, by hand. Right now, the staff is shrinking. Uh, as a solid developer, you're getting access to tools that no were never accessible before. Um, you spend less problems on any technical issues, and in the results, you actually gain the creative freedom in this case. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, there are many aspects for you know building the proper cinematic experience um, in the Android engine, but you know having the uh, really good tools for having, making your animation is one of the most important ones. Um, nobody is arguing with the fact that you cannot be the big studio uh, with uh, so many tools available for you know for all the studios. But the point is, right now you actually have the freedom to tell your story, story um, in your own way. Um, so I'm just going to show the very uh, short part of the cinematic as an example. Which is 
going to be available for everyone. Uh, I will post the link for the presentation and the material for Red Spoon and Discord uh, for the Android uh, PDFs. Uh, but over here, I have listed uh, the links for all of the resources I've mentioned so far. Um, the one thing I would add in this case is also the, the, the interplay with the William Fletcher uh, channel. And I have also something I haven't mentioned before, but I use this uh, free next gen AAA characters for Unreal Engine course specifically uh, with the intent of how you can make the custom character using the MetaHuman because right at the back there is a very limited um, you know the controls you have when you're making your really MetaHuman. Like it's really amazing tool, but um, the course will give you the insight how you can actually go a little further in this case. You can actually export your character, um, adjust maybe like some uh, facial uh, parts like in a blender or a brush, and you can um, import it back into Unreal and just you may, you know make the character as custom as possible. So um, it will also give you the insights on um, how you can make the different size of the or scale of the character. So for example, you can actually make it like your huge short character using the same net human skeleton. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something that you can uh, definitely use. Uh, that concludes uh, my presentation. I really appreciate everyone coming um, and I will answer different questions if you guys have. You're going to do this project in five years. What you're hoping would be easier or faster at that point or but you already Um, I'm hoping that there's going to be less focus on, you know, the technical aspects of how you actually are going to perform the cleanup, or you can actually record your animation, um, and um, it's going to be more, more focus on the creative, you know, our, maybe our direction, or just the creative freedom for user in this case. So you have your animation is, you know, maybe being processed on, I would say. Like, Different service uh, back, back on, on, the, on the background of the different service, and then you put it right into your sequencer in the Unreal Engine, and you can actually just start performing or making a recording of your, you know, the scene. Um, so again, the focus is less technical and more creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Take I hope so. Um, I'm actually expecting, well, I'm hoping that there's going to be more focus given to the current uh, animation tool, specifically animation that um, adjusts this into being real. That will remove the need to go into different applications with Blender or Maya to adjust it because pretty much everything you need to do is going to be available in the Unreal that do that. So I'm definitely hoping that we're going to get to this point. Oh, wait for AI to do my own. Yeah, well, again, uh, for example, if I mentioned the movie AI, they definitely have some AI capabilities behind the scenes, uh, which are, I think this is, I hope, I'm hoping the word is going to be the focus in this case. So, different backend and AI services, they're going to remove the need to perform, you know, in cleanup. Um, one thing I would mention is, um, there's going to be a little more focus on the finger animation because the facial animation is one of the hardest ones, but I think the next um, the next iteration, at least I hope for the ethics, maybe they think they're developing something in that regard, focus more on the uh, making the precise finger animation because I think right now it is still something that you probably need to make sure to get more manual most of the time. The next thing that Um, and it's also going to be available for any character, just making sure that it's going to be you know, the same skeleton uh, for all the characters. But the same animation, um, you know, should work for, for example, if you're going to use metahumans all over the place, um, you can just switch uh, the same animation and just put it to the different character, which is, which is something that you can really do. Yeah, Yeah.
there's a lazy people involved in that. Yeah. They'll, they'll figure out who's doing stupid stuff. <laughs> Before that, I actually did not anticipate I'm going to get to the point when I'm going to make my own shots in a minute. My, my intent was only like how, cost, how, I, how much I can customize my own, my own human character. Because before that, I had my own iteration of the character I made in the ZBrush manually, which didn't work that well as I expected, but at the same time, I was able to readjust the, you know, the overall proportions and got to the point that it will be easier to use the medium in this case because, especially with the capabilities of the animation and mostly thanks to the official uh, motion capture, because otherwise, if you are working with a custom character, you actually need to build um, all of it from scratch. And Blender actually has the plugin for it, it's all faces, I think. It's where you're actually going to build your own uh, morphs and the blend shades, but it takes a lot of iterations and it's a huge amount of work, which has already been done for the um, And then after this, I decided, okay, well, maybe I can maybe, maybe I throw a scene or two with the character just to showcase it was important in my art station portfolio. And then I'm like, okay, maybe I can go for it in my own scene uh, with the, you know, different sets of characters. Awesome. Well, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Again, uh, the presentation is going to be available on the link. I'm going to, I'm going to post the link on the Discord. Um, I'm always available if you have any questions or help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.